here's a pancake probe. So now it's picking up all the alpha. Can't fake that. A lot of what can be said for this depleted uranium round has already been laid out in the first video I made at the beginning of this year, so I'll be skipping over a lot of those specifics, but I've learned some new things about the round that I'll share with you here. If you want a good rundown on duds, watch the previous video. I will be shooting both of these 762 by 51 mm depleted uranium discarding Sabo rounds in this video and assuming all of the risks involved. A lot can go wrong here. But aside from the very minor radiation and metal toxicity risk, the biggest two issues I can see are if the Sabo petals have degraded over time, or if the round is simply hotter than what we can tell. If the round disintegrates before it leaves the barrel, it could be catastrophic for the rifle, and could cause me a serious injury, but this Havoc rifle by Seagans Precision is more than capable of resisting a hotter round, and I'm sure any potential barrel damage will be directed forward. Optimistic. Still, I wore a thick polycarbonate shield to protect myself from the shower of ceramic splash and spicy particles that would be sent back from such a close impact. The helmet is indeed a titanium PSH-77 by TIG Bicord, once again proving that nothing is beyond my reach. How many of these rounds ended up in civilian hands remains up to speculation. However, according to a report given to the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, there was one example around 30 years ago where this depleted uranium ammo was accidentally distributed to a local American police department. Hidden amongst normal 38 rounds, these depleted uranium rounds were fired on a police training range. I'm sure that many more of the rounds are out there from this mistake and maybe others, and also from more innocent sources, like the actual scientists from Pacific Technica keeping souvenirs, because why the hell wouldn't you? Both of these rounds have been reloaded mostly to examine them. One has been reloaded with original powder, and the other had to be replaced by our best commercial approximation of the load. The powder in the original round appears to be Patek's own proprietary blend, but that's just an educated guess. If these grains spark any nostalgia of anyone familiar with commercial powder produced 53 years ago, feel free to leave a comment. If we end up light loading the round, it should be alright. Part of the power of these rounds is that they have great terminal ballistics because of the increased density. And we still have the original powder load from the first round, so we should be good either way. The target will be an Adept Armor Colossus plate that was generously donated by Adept Armor. The plate is rated against Swiss Ruag tungsten rounds and is a silicon and titanium technical ceramic based plate with a polyethylene backer. It will be backed up by a Revision H e Sappy, a layer of IOTV Kevlar, as well as four water buckets to make absolutely sure that the round is captured. This target is obviously not strictly scientific, but my friend James CZ has run good simulations on the steel penetration of the round. I'd simply like to know how it would fare against ceramics, as that is much more difficult to simulate. So the duds rounds when they were new chronoed at around 3800 feet per second from the factory. So let's take our first shot with the round we've reloaded with commercial powder. I have never been nervous on any of these ballistic tests before. This was a first. Uranium has pyrotechnic effects when it shears at high speeds. That snap, crackle, pop that you hear is actual uranium metal catching a light. With that in mind, watch my visor in this clip. The chronograph on this shot only recorded around 2,000 feet per second. However, the damage to the Colossus plate is substantial. The plastic Sabo pedals alone have cratered the face of it, and I found the depleted uranium round had enough energy to indent the ESAPI behind the main plate. The bullet was sticking out of the rear of the Colossus plate, 
and had the ESAPI not been backing it up, the round would have easily penetrated that plate at nearly 1,000 feet per second slower than the original load. So let's shoot it again with the original ready, load. Ready, ready. Thirty-eight hundred seventy-one feet per second. Fifty-three years after the date of manufacture and the round works flawlessly. But how about the results? Well, from either the angle of the impact or the angle of the plate, the round has had its force directed slightly off-center. The plate has managed to capture the round with more deformation to the backspace than the first hit. Again, the USAPI may have acted as mass to reduce the deformation here, and stop the penetration of the plate despite the nearly 1,000 feet per second velocity increase. Angles matter. But the round also may have simply tumbled and not struck exactly tip first. Hard to say. I've now tested the greatest small arms armor piercing incendiary round ever made. It's all downhill from here. In my opinion, the depleted uranium discarding Sabo rounds represent an extremely feasible and effective projectile that has plenty of justification to be put back into service regardless of the risks. Thanks to everyone that made this possible. These two short duds videos were around half a year in the making, and I've got even more exciting projects in the works. If you noticed my name on the news recently, don't worry about it, um, it's not really affecting me too much. I've recently made my channel's Discord server Patreon only, because um, I don't think keeping a Patreon as public is probably a good idea at this point. But yeah, uh, everything's good. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.